Let's remain standing as we sing our national anthem, accompanied on the national instrument by Letitia Emmanuel of Diego Martin Central Secondary School and member of the Diamond Vale Youth Seal Ensemble. I now call on Reverend Father Ashton Gomez of St. Michael and All Angels Anglican Church for the opening prayer. Good morning, everyone. The Lord be with you. Let us pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, we give you thanks today for the opening of this new library in the borough of Diego Martin. Lord, we pray for those who have labored for this project to come to its fruition. We pray for those who would work here, that they will make it an inviting and warm place. We pray for those who will make use of this place, that they will grow in wisdom and in stature and fall in love with learning and become productive citizens of this land of Trinidad and Tobago. Pray for the government and for their vision for this island nation. We ask you, O Lord, to continue to allow them to see and hear the needs of the people. Lord, we pray that those who will make use of this place, and we pray for the citizens in particular of Digo Martin, that they will take full advantage of all that is being offered to them through this library this morning. May we also be commissioned, O Lord, in your own love, to come to know you more and more, and to spread the good news. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. We may all be seated. Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. The Honorable Simon de Nobrega, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, Communications, and Member of Parliament for Diego Martin Central. Honorable Members of the Cabinet. Her Worship, Alderman Achillea Glasgow Warner, Mayor of the Borough of Diego Martin, and Councillors of the Borough. Ms. Kiva Williams, Permanent Secretary, Office of the Prime Minister, Communications, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ms. Albada Beacom, and Management and Staff of the Ministry. Mr. Neil Parson Lau, Chairman, National Library and Information System Authority, NALIS, members of the Board, Management and Staff of NALIS. Dr. Wayne A. I. Frederick, retired President, Howard University. Ms. Wendy Fitzwilliam, Attorney and Miss Universe 1998. Dr. Hollis Liverpool, educator and Calypsonian. Mr. Noel Garcia, chairman of the board of Udicott and members of the board, members of the clergy, teachers and students of Diego Martin and surrounding environs, residents, stalwarts, and stakeholders of Diego Martin and environs, specially invited guests, members of the media, members of the national public viewing live, ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Marc-Andre Augustus, and it is my pleasure 
to welcome you all to the official opening ceremony for the Diego Martin Public Library. Our pearl of wisdom, insight, and knowledge for the today is, with all you're getting, get understanding. First on our program, kindly welcome Her Worship Alderman Akilia Glasgow Warner to bring us her welcoming remarks. The Honorable Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley, Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Member of Parliament for Digo Martin West. The Honorable Com Inbert, Minister of Finance, Member of Parliament for Digo Martin Northeast. The Honorable Simon de Nobrega, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, Communications, Member of Parliament for Digo Martin Central all other cabinet members and parliamentary representatives. Deputy Mayor, Aldermen and Councillors of the Digo Martin Borough Corporation, Mr. Neil Parsonlal, Chairman of NALIS, Chairman of UDICAT, Mr. Noel Garcia, UDICAT Management and Staff, Teachers and Students, Specially Invited Guests, members of the media, members of the national public viewing live, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. On behalf of the Borough of Digo Martin, it gives me immense pleasure to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you here today. Thank you for greeting us with your presence. Today, we gather to witness a grand but humble expression of the government's commitment to building stronger and more resilient communities. As we embark on the launch of this community library, let us embrace this new journey, a journey of education, social connection, innovation, local economic development, and a place that will become a particularly important hub in times of need. This project would not have been possible except for the astute leadership of Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, our Prime Minister, who prioritized the establishment of this state-of-the-art library for our borough. Thank you, Dr. Rowley, and everyone who made this library possible. This strategic decision is intended to foster the culture of literacy, intellectual exploration, and critical thinking within the community, contributing to the betterment of its residents' well-being. As a child growing up in Karanaj, my passion for reading and poetry was ignited by the few books available at the, at the small library, library reading room in my primary school. Despite the challenges of accessing more extensive resources, I was determined to expand my knowledge and understanding of the world around me. I vividly recall the long journeys to the capital city of Port of Spain, where I would spend hours devouring books at the public library, fueled by a thirst for knowledge and a hunger for learning. Residents of Digo Martin no longer must make that journey. That journey has come to you. But on reflection of that journey, I am reminded of a powerful quote by Trinidad and Tobago's first Prime Minister, Dr. Eric Williams. The future of the nation is in the children's school bags. These words resonate deeply with me as they underscore the vital role that education and access to resources play in shaping the future of our nation. By investing in our children's education and providing them with the tools they need to succeed, we are laying the foundation for a brighter and more prosperous future. As the mayor of this vibrant community, I am thrilled and excited to have this invalu invaluable resource in our borough. Its value cannot be overstated as it is not merely a building filled with books, but rather a sanctuary of knowledge, a gateway to imagination, and a beacon of enlightenment. 
Let us embrace this new chapter with enthusiasm, optimism, and a renewed commitment to a culture of lifelong learning and intellectual curiosity within our beloved borough. Once again, warmest welcome to all of you to witness the launch of this library, which would undoubtedly become a cherished asset for generations to come. Thank you all for joining us on this momentous occasion, and I continue to have boundless faith in our destiny. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship, Alderman Glasgow Warner. Let's now welcome to the podium the Chairman of the National Library and Information System Authority, NALIS, Mr. Neil Parsonlau, to bring us his remarks. Dr. The Honorable Pr Keith Rowdy, Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. The Honorable Simon de Nobrega, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister Communications, Member of Parliament for Diego Martin Central. The Honorable Com Colm Imbert, Minister of Finance. Her Worship, Alderman Aquilo Glasgow Warner, Mayor of the Borough of Diego Martin and Councillors of the Borough. Ms. Kiva Williams, Permanent Secretary, Office of the Prime Minister Communications. Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ms. Albado Mecham, and management and staff of the ministry. Executive Director of NALIS, Paula Green, Deputy Executive Director, Beverly Williams, and Sir Noel Garcia, Chairman of the Board of Udicott, and members of the board. Other members of the board of NALIS, members of the clergy, teachers and students of Diego Martin and surrounding environs, our distinguished invited guests, Hollis Liverpool, Wendy Fitzwilliam, Paul Keynes Douglas, it's always good to have persons like yourselves around in situations like this. On behalf of the board, executive and deputy executive directors, the management and staff of NALIS, I extend a warm welcome to all of you today to the formal opening of the Diego Martin Public Library. This library joins NALIS's asset base of the Heritage Library, 24 public libraries, four institutional libraries, 133 school libraries, 48 special libraries, and three libraries in Tobago. At NALIS, we await, admittedly with some degree of concern, the outcome of deliberations on the ultimate paternity of another asset, the iconic National Library Building, the flagship of NALIS's operations. Ladies and gentlemen, the opening of this library has generated much interest from varying segments of the national community. Some, though often publicly critical of this administration, have been more than effusive in their congratulations on this venture. Many have come forward, like culture journalist Peter Ray Blood, to offer his own repository of work, garnered over more than 30 years in the field. Rhonda D'Souza, a stalwart businesswoman, business owner of this community, who has offered her own collection of books and other reading material. And professional barber, Don Donald McLean James, who has promised to donate copies of his book, The Art of Barbering. I'm looking forward as well to personally meeting two young authors, Kiev and Ev Eviana, age eight and nine years old, to read the series they have written together entitled Big Star Farm, and to have them added to our children's collection. To all of them, I offer our sincerest thanks and assurances that we will be in touch with them very soon. We are extremely grateful at NALIS to the government, led by a published author himself, and whose second book we eagerly await, Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, for this investment in the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is an investment which touches the very heart of who we are as a people, how we see ourselves now, and the unlimited possibilities that arise out of that singular decision. It is an investment decision that will bring immeasurable rewards. And while the return on that investment is not always immediately realizable in dollars and cents, those of us who are intimately involved in the delivery of library and information services are only too aware of the far-reaching impact of libraries on a country's socio-economic development. With libraries currently under construction in La Hoqueta, Mayaro, and Chagonas, we are confident that this investment will redound handsomely to the citizens of those communities as well, in much the same way as the people of Diego Martin will benefit from this. There are those, however, who have sought to question and malign this investment. 
arguing that the construction of public libraries is anachronistic to the society that aspires to move into the digital age. Nothing could be further from the truth. Sadly, the criticism comes more often than not when any investment is made in areas deemed to be populated by cockroaches, the same cockroaches who are now being courted as constituents by those who christen them as such. But God, class, and entitlement complexes aside, no amount of investment in the personal and professional development of the people of Trinidad and Tobago could ever be enough. Any investment that produces a model citizen, as the mighty Sparrow intimated, is a welcome investment. It is for this reason, Prime Minister, that on behalf of the board and management, which I hasten to add is led by two of Trinidad and Tobago's finest female professionals, we give our assurance that the mustard seed you planted with this investment will indeed blossom into a tree that will provide shade and shelter to all of Diego Martin. Prime Minister, I've sought to guide the work of NALIS over the last few years on the basis of a few simple principles, one of which is, when language ends, violence begins. Our responsibility at NALIS then, as we so ably demonstrated during the throes of the COVID-19 pandemic, is to ensure uninterrupted accessibility and availability of library and information services, particularly to the underserved constituencies. Those are not so named because of their physical location, but include the elderly and physically challenged, the visually and hearing impaired, and those who live on the margins of society. It is to them more than anyone else that this library and all our libraries belong and must become home. Today though, I wish to make a special appeal to one such constituency and one of our country's rapidly depreciating assets, our young black males. When we turned the sod for the commencement of construction of the La Hoqueta Public Library last year, I made a similar appeal, and it elicited two different comments. One, which felt we, as those of us in officialdom, are not speaking compellingly enough and in their language to the young black males in our different communities. The other comment was such an appeal had no right on a public platform. Now, ladies and gentlemen, while those voices might accuse some of either being too black to speak to those south of the bridge, or others as being representative of a particular percentage, and therefore disqualified to speak to those east of the bridge, I am black mixed with black, so I will speak. And I will continue to make my appeal, particularly to all the young black males, to see their redemption, their salvation, and their continued earthly existence in the opportunities made possible by public libraries. You are worth more than being a bagman for someone else, or a mule for others, or a watchman whose only job is to warn your superiors about the imminent approach of either the police or another gang. It was the same way they used and abused those from whom you descended and whose names you regularly call. And even they rebelled against such treatment. You were created for more than that. Today, I say to all my young black brothers and sisters, my black nephews and nieces in Bagatelle and La Puerta, in Covina and Simeon Road, come. Let's reason together. Today I say to all of you, a cat that aspires to be a lion must first abandon the taste for rats. So to all my young brethren and sistren, in the words of the world's favorite poet Bob Marley, turn your lights down low, pull back your window curtains, and let Jamun come shining through into your lives again. We at NALIS understand your disappointment with the adults and hierarchy around you. We sold you a dream that said if you go to school, study hard and pass all your subjects, then you'll find a good job. And that has not happened. Come to the library, and we will walk back with you through all those areas of your lives, or even help you to discover areas that are best suited to your particular and peculiar learning style. Come to the library, and we will teach you how to become an entrepreneur, 
and put you in touch with a multiplicity of other government services available to you. We at NALIS understand your confusion about du the duplicity of adults that surround you, particularly those who occupy positions of power and influence. While the lyrics they espouse at once pervasive and destructive encourage you to load up the matic, they continue to use your crimes and tragic deaths as horses on which they intend to ride and return to Abercrombie Street. Come instead to the library. The lyrics we use in the library will put new weapons in your hands, weapons of personal growth and empowerment, lyrics that will save your lives. We at NALIS understand your dilemma as secondary school students, because notwithstanding your weaknesses in comprehension, language, arts, and mathematics, you were placed in the same grammar-type schools as others who performed better. Your only mask now for your weakness is rebellion and disruption. Come to the library instead. You will learn gamification. You will learn about artificial intelligence. You will learn that your storytelling capacity has value and that your rebellious art says more about the environment that has socialized you than about your unworthiness to be part of that environment. Come to the Diego Martin Public Library. We will open for business bright and early tomorrow morning. Come, join this gang of readers and researchers, of mentors and teachers, of dreamers and visionaries to help you realize the dreams you once had for yourselves. Come, let's build a nation together. Prime Minister Dr. Frederick, invited guests to all, welcome to the Diego Martin Public Library. Thank you, Chairman Parsonal, as we acquire understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly welcome former Miss Universe 1998 and attorney, Miss Wendy Marcel Fitzwilliam, to present a poetry reading. Good morning. Thank you all protocols observed. I am actually going to read a passage from um, a book by Judy Raymond about Beryl McBurney. And this is going to be a little bit of a test for me because my dear Prime Minister chose these passages and shared it with me this morning. <laughs> He's taken over from my mother, but I'm sure you will enjoy uh, these passages, this reading. When Columbus arrived in 1498, Trinidad had been inhabited for thousands of years by the first peoples, who were labeled Caribs and Arawaks by the Spanish colonists, and respectively as belligerent cannibals and a peace-loving, lazy people who spent their time swimming, swinging in their hammocks. The Spanish tried to force these Amerindians to work for them with little success. Some were worked or beaten to death. Some fell victim to European diseases to which they had no immunity. A few slipped away along ancient trails to the south coast and then to the forests of South America a few miles away. The Spanish did little to exploit Trinidad. The British captured it in 1797 but even 15 years later, only 10% of it was under cultivation. This was largely thanks to an earlier influx in the, in the 1780s of planters from Grenada and Martinique. Alarmed by the unrest in France, they sought a safer place to settle, bringing enslaved Africans with them, and the Spanish gave them grants of land to cultivate. Until then, the entire population had been fewer than 3,000. Even under the British, Trinidad never became a fully developed sugar colony, in contrast with islands like Jamaica, Barbados, and Tobago. By the time Britain captured Trinidad, these islands had been under sugar for close to 200 years and had their own semi-autonomous governments. Trinidad instead 
became the first crown colony ruled directly from Britain via the governor. It was not very British, though. The population, enslaved and free, spoke a French patois, along with some Spanish. And it was only in the 1840s that Governor Lord Harris began a drive to anglicize both the language and the laws. Nevertheless, many people spoke patois up until the 1940s, and French and Spanish cultural influences also lingered. Ten years after Trinidad became a British colony, the slave trade was abolished in the British Empire, sealing the fate of the sugar economies of the West Indies, and especially Trinidad, which had always had a labor shortage. The Royal Navy captured slave ships passing through the Caribbean en route to Cuba and Brazil, and some of the recently enslaved Africans on board were freed and deposited in Trinidad, where it was hoped that they would supply the needed workforce. Instead, many formed free communities in East Port of Spain. They worked in the city as tradesmen and businessmen, but retained many of their own practices and beliefs. Meanwhile, before emancipation in 1834, enslaved workers on their estates spent much of the free time allowed them, Saturday evening to Monday morning, holding dances. This was one of the few occasions when they were allowed to gather to spend their time as they pleased. The planters imposed strict restrictions on the dances, such as limiting the hours when it was permitted to beat African drums. They feared these gatherings might turn into insurrections, especially after the success of the Haitian Revolution of 1804. But the enslaved laborers, the weekend dances were, among other things, a chance to forge, to forget the misery of their lives and lose themselves in the music. The combined elements of each other's traditional dances, as well as European dances, they found appealing. This was a particularly rich mixture in Trinidad, whose European descendants, European descended inhabitants, came from so many countries, and many of whose African descendants, descended people, had never been enslaved, or only briefly. These were the dances that McBurney learned on her nocturnal expeditions with Carr, or her dances into the countryside of some of the less middle-class Europeanized areas of Fort of Spain. Her area of interest was novel, but in setting out to discover more about the African origins of local culture, of which some Trinidadians were beginning to be conscious and even proud, McBurney was part of a movement her research trips were remarkable. However, because of her class and gender, few respected middle-class girls who would have dared to undertake such expeditions. What her family thought of these ventures had not been recorded. They probably disapproved, but thanks to her charm, self-confidence, and determination, Beryl was never a person to whom anyone could easily say no. McBurney used these qualities to get what she wanted, a useful ability in later years when she had to raise money or find anything else the little carib theater needed. Every word she speaks in her nervous, tender voice, wrote American reporter Betty Reef, West, Ind West Indians gain respect for heritage by dancing, a publication of the 20th of October, 1961, obviously fascinated McBurney. Her bright eyes flash and roll, her expressive hand, hands wave, her feet tap, nervous. Hair does not mean timid. Rather, McBurney was highly strung and bursting with ideas. She had a racing mind and her conversations jumped from one topic to another, but said Ron Julian, one of her dancers, she was bright enough to do anything she wanted. She always dressed the part too, ensuring she looked striking, if not downright eccentric. 
Many of those who knew her commented on her outfit. Hmm, sounds familiar. Anne Sanford, who danced for McBurney in the latter, in, in the latter years, remembered. Beryl always wore black, long-sleeved leotard and a long dance skirt. The skirt was sometimes a colorful one, but she mostly wore black. She always had a head tie. She loved big, gaudy jewelry. Big, colorful beads around her neck and bracelets. She liked pearls, too. She was heavy on the feet, and you heard Beryl coming and her bracelets clanking. She liked to stop and po po poise her neck midway. She was simply impressive and eccentric. These costumes were an important outward expression of McBurney's independent spirit and forcefulness. She liked to stand out in all sorts of ways. All of these elements, plus her knowledge of local folk dance traditions, the recognition of their importance, and her sense of possession, possessing a mission, no doubt played a large part in her decision to return to Trinidad after studying and performing abroad. Beryl was born on the 2nd of October of November, I'm October, forgive me, 1913, according to her birth certificate. The program from her funeral says she was born in 1912. Other sources, even close friends of hers, gave dates ranging from 1907 to 1917. Yes. McBurney never included her date of birth in documents such as her curriculum vitae or her resume. It is typical of her that it is hard to pin down even the year she was born, whether telling the story of her life or building a theater in her mother's backyard without planning permission. Normal rules did not apply to Beryl McBurney. The house where the McBurneys and the Rollocks lived had been described as a tiny wooden gingerbread house. Vanetta Rollock called it very modest, but the family was middle class, even though the house was among the smaller ones in the Gentile district of Woodbrook. In addition, they would have considered themselves and been considered not black but colored, an important class distinction in those days and in preceding generations, and one which would have helped give McBurney the self-confidence that later allowed her to make outrageous demands in the furtherance of her cause. But although her optimism and persistence were all her own, her ideas were shared by many. The little city of Port of Spain had been expanding for a century. Woodbrook to the west was bought by the Sergat family, correct? Manufacturers of Angostura bitters in 1899, but in 1911, they sold it to the government. The old town of Fort of Spain was still the commercial and administrative center, but much of the city's housing had become run down. Where once free African communities had flourished in the hills of Laventil, on the banks of the dry river below, now those narrow streets harbored tiny shacks and the notorious barrack yards where entire families were crammed into one room. Belmont, formerly known as Freetown, had also housed African communities, but the cottages packed along its alleys could not accommodate the numbers or the ambitions of the growing black and colored middle class. I'm going to read one more paragraph because this is where Beryl gets to Diego Martin, which is where we are. So they poured into the new houses along the wide, flat streets of Woodbrook, laid out in neat grids along grassy public squares served by modern electric tram cars and lit by electric lights. C.L.R. James described this lifestyle when Haynes, the protagonist of his 1936 novel, Minty Alley, first looked through the front window of Mrs. Rousseau's lodging house as he goes to rent a room there. They made their way outwards to Diego Martin, the McBurney's. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Fitzwilliam, for knowledge of our history and our cultural icon. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a special welcome to retired president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne Frederick, as I now call on him to address us. Good morning. I was just telling the Minister of Education that um, you know, in the US, we don't go through the protocols, so all protocols are observed. So, and I, I'm glad that um, Ms. Will, Ms. Fitzwilliams did that. This is my first opportunity uh, to actually speak in front of um, Ms. Fitzwilliams and uh, Mr. Liverpool, uh, both of whom live here in Diamond Vale, where I grew up. So I first want to take an opportunity to say to Ms. Fitzwilliams that grace is the source that goes between love and life. And I don't think anybody epitomizes it as much as you do. So thanks for all that you do. Libraries, by definition, are collections of books and other materials that are used for the purpose of education. However, the modern day library is really also a collection of people and culture. And it is my hope that this library would represent exactly that, the modern day library, where the exchange of ideas and thoughts, the debate that must occur in young people's development to help them form their moral compass would take place. The most important people here today are these young people here to my left. I had the opportunity to grow up in this neighborhood. As a matter of fact, um, I was happy to see my priest here. I actually served as an altar boy in the Anglican church right there at St. Michael's. Uh, many of you know I have sickle cell. I actually was taken care of at the Digger Martin Health Center, so it's great to see the fantastic facility uh, just yards away from here. I attended Digger Martin Government Primary right down uh, the main road here. So I am definitely a product of this, and so I'm very humbled today uh, to see these young people have the opportunity that I had. I was a lover of books from an early age. My mother instilled in me that reading was extremely important. So everything from Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew Mysteries uh, to her buying an encyclopedia, which I remember was one of the major investments um, in my household. Uh, that library sales agent uh, had to visit us probably a dozen times, probably was the least amount of money he ever made on a sale of an encyclopedia because my mother wanted everything at the cheapest price. But that encyclopedia purchase is one of the things that lit the fire in me in terms of education. I remember looking up how to grow potatoes, and I'm not sure why I was obsessed with that topic, but I looked that up in the encyclopedia and tried to create a little area in my backyard to do exactly that. Using one of my mother's thermometers, she was a nurse, but using one of her thermometers to check the temperature of the soil as well on a daily basis, as I learned in the encyclopedia. But today is also extremely special because not only was I a product of this neighborhood, but I benefited from the people in this neighborhood. People like Miss Wendy Fitzwilliams, people like uh, Mr. Liverpool, who you guys know commonly as Chorglers, who grew up on my street. Those are the people who inspired me. You heard about Peter Ray Blood, he was actually my next door neighbor. And so these are the people that surrounded me every single day. And excellence, which I think is the repetitive action of effort, I saw every day. I saw in the people around me in my neighborhood. George Goddard, who did so much for Pan. So this little neighborhood right here that this library now sits in had people who were producing things that would inspire me in so many ways. I was humbled as I retired from Howard University to have the undergraduate library at Howard named after me. And I told my children that I never thought one day there would be my name on a library. So as I stand here today, I want to make it absolutely clear that a place like this belongs in our society today. The future of this nation, as our founding father, Dr. Eric Williams said, is in the future of the school bags of the young people. But I also want to make it clear that we have a responsibility to support those young people. So this cannot be a place of bricks and mortar and books. It has to be a place of us. We have to come to this library and support these young people. I thought it was extremely important to hear Ms. Fitzwilliams read today to us because I hope that we would have those types of readings from the adults in this community to the young people in this community because that is obviously what they deserve. There's nothing like instilling confidence in a child. And there's nothing like giving confidence to a child by giving them knowledge. Because knowledge does produce that confidence in you. 
And I hope that we will support that. I think it was Pierre de Chardin who said that someday after mastering the waves, the tides, and gravity, we shall harness for God the energies of love, and for the second time in the history of man, we shall discover fire. It is libraries like this that will light that pilot light of fire in young people and have them see a world of possibility way beyond them. Have them see things and experience things and have ambitions for things. So with that in mind, I also recognize that the public education that I receive and the public health care that I receive, which was a very generous benefit from the government, is one that cannot be sustained. And so it is my hope that private citizens like myself and corporate Trinidad and Tobago would support efforts like this. And so I'm going to take the lead on that today. My wife and I, and I had to call her this morning to get final permission, but I'm happy to say <laughs> that my wife and I will donate a million dollars TT to a fund that we would like to put in the Ministry of Education to support all infrastructure needs. And I know that that's... <clears throat> So in the presence of the Prime Minister and the Ministers of Education and Finance, I appeal to Corporate Trinidad and Tobago today and my fellow citizens to donate and support and match such an effort because it is that investment in the infrastructure of our schools, of our libraries, and of all the other social aspects that we need that we will get there. We are spending a lot of time being cynical and blaming our youth for the present things like crime, etc. But I have to tell you, as a father of two young people, one 19, who, as a president of a university, it was to my shock that he would drop out of school to become a professional soccer player, but I'm fully supportive. <clears throat> and I will say that he was actually ahead in his graduation, so I'm pretty sure he'll go back and get his degree. And a 17-year-old young lady who is applying to colleges and universities and wants to become an orthopedic surgeon to take care of high-performing female athletes only, so she is an ad advocate and an activist, as you can tell. But because of those two young people who grew up in my household, I am absolutely not cynical about our youth. Not here in Trinidad and Tobago, not in the U.S., not anywhere in the world. And I hope none of us would become cynical about them. They don't learn about crime or to commit crimes when they come out of the womb. That's not what they come with. They come with an innocence that we have to protect and they come with an innocence that we tend to destroy with our own cynicism and with our actions. So I hope we would all take it upon ourselves to not be cynical about them, to remember that hope is the anticipation of tomorrow and to provide them with hope by investing in them. And that investment does not have to be a million TT dollars. That investment is of your time. Every single opportunity that you have to stop and talk to one of those youths every single day in every single community is your sacred obligation and responsibility. And just like I try to come here every month and go visit schools all over this country, whether it's Cedrus or Point Fortin, and I'm gonna to continue to do that, I hope that you would take time out of your busy days every single day and just give that child one thing that is priceless, and that is your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Frederick, for your commitment to youth, your generosity, advice, and wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, let's now take a look at this video production from Office of the Prime Minister, Communication. Libraries bring to the fore 
or Musa egalistic system that affords everyone even footed when they go to it? To me, the library is important because it enhances someone's knowledge. Young persons, young adults, children like myself, it gives us a chance to read and understand different things. So we want people to know that libraries are places where we level the playing field between the rich and the poor. There are a number of persons who do not have internet access at home and our libraries provide that. I'm very excited about this new Diego Martin purpose-built library. You have the auditorium, you have the amphitheater, you have the computers, the children's section, the young adult section, the adult section. We're so ex very excited about it and we just invite people to come in. This was a production of the National Library and Information System Authority and the Office of the Prime Minister Communications. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to the Honorable Simon de Nobrega, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, Communications, and Member of Parliament for Diego Martin Central, as he brings us his remarks. Thank you very much. When he and we and you all are very lucky, I, however, do not have the privilege been able to see all protocols observed. So let me observe those protocols and start by acknowledging the Member of Parliament for Diego Martin West, our Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, my parliamentary and cabinet colleague, and the Member of Parliament for Diego Martin North, the Honorable Colm Imbert, Minister of Finance, the Her Worship Alderman Akila Glasgow Warner, Mayor of the Borough of Diego Martin, as well as the Councillors of Diego Martin, the Diego Martin Borough. 
the Chairman of the National Library and Information Systems, Mr. Neil Parsonal, as along with, along with the members of the board, the management, and staff, and in particular, Ms. Paula Green, the Executive Director of NALIS, and Ms. Beverly Williams, the Deputy Director of NALIS. Uh, Mr. Noel Garcia, the Chairman of the Board of UDICOT, along with the members of the Board of UDICOT, my own Permanent Secretary in the Office of the Prime Minister, Communications and my Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ms. Keva Williams and Ms. Albada Beacom, as along with the management and staff of, of my ministry. Mr. Wayne Frederick, retired President, Howard University, Ms. Wendy Fitzwilliam, Attorney and Miss Universe of 1998, Dr. Hollis Liverpool ORTT. and all other especially invited guests. Members of the clergy, and most particularly the teachers and the students of Vigo Martin and the surrounding, environment, the envi the surrounding environs, the residents, the stalwarts and stakeholders of Vigo Martin, our members of the media, the members of the national public viewing on air and online, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, I'm not as lucky as you all are. So, I could begin today by saying that this is one of the best days uh, of my tenure as a member of Parliament for Digger Martin Central, as it, it's that happy, happy confluence between policy and action, because it represents um, a decision taken, a decision reduced to paper, images on a screen now made actually present before our eyes. I could also say that it is a happy day for me as a minister with responsibility for libraries because it is always, it is always gratifying to see a project conceived, take life and delivered to those who are to actually make use of it. It is also particularly gratifying to be able to sit in the shade of the trees of which we have planted. And today I'm not only able to sit in the shade of this tree, but I'm also able to do so understanding how the delivery of library and information services to the people of Digo Martin has progressed and has evolved over time. And by doing this today, we are also honoring and extending the work of my predecessor, the former member of Parliament for Diego Martin Central, now deceased Ken Cyril Valley, because it was in his office in 1991, as it was then, and as it is now at number one Orchid Drive in Pitti Valley, that the delivery of library services to the people of this region began. And it stayed there for roughly about 10 years, when, on, when in 20, 2001, it then moved to rented premises at the Digo Martin Consumer Cooperative Mall at the other end of the Wendy Fitzwilliam Boulevard. And it was there for, I would say, maybe about 15 years. But unfortunately, due to recurrent health and safety issues, and after extended time consuming and costly attempts to keep it running, it finally closed in 2015, 2016. And uh, at that point, library services to this region ceased. Now, I say ceased, be, but there were still attempts to, to deliver services. 2017, now less I believe it was with the Diego Martin Central Community Center, a partnership was formed uh, where library services were brought out of a little room and a library vehicle, but Quite frankly, that was neither, um, it, it simply was not sustainable. The simple truth is that Diego Martin required a fully functional public library to serve this region. And that is why today I'm as elated as I am to be here to witness with you the opening of this new library and the restarting of full library services to the borough of Leo Martin. And I wish to especially thank and congratulate the Friends of the Library Volunteer Group, established by the late Vera Chong, herself a former librarian, and made up of 
committed members of the community, members like Glenda Jarrett, Joyce Bean, Yolan Clement, Grace Samuel, Denise Reed, and Stephanie Lylong, the name but a few. Their volunteerism focused on supporting community-based projects, programs, and library activities. And long may their work and the work of groups like theirs continue. I also want to take the opportunity to thank the residents in the immediate vicinity of this library who would have been inconvenienced to some extent during the construction phase for their patience and understanding during that time and of course as we settle in. But we are here now and from this much larger footprint then, NALIS will resume its, its much needed work contributing to the development of every single member of this community, regardless of age, gender, creed, or class. And in addition to all these services used usually associated with libraries in the, in the traditional sense, literacy enhancement initiatives, homework assistance, storytelling sessions, for which I have already been happily recruited Dr. Frederick, and I expect that you will be as well. And on that note, let me mention how happy I am as well to see the country's foremost storyteller, Mr. Paul Keynes Douglas, with us here today. Welcome, Mr. Douglas, and thank you for joining us. All of those, as well as services to those who are visually impaired, low vision, hearing impaired, or print disabled, will be provided here within these walls. I'm also particularly pleased that the NALIS executive has advised that resources will be put towards documenting, preserving, and protecting the history of the people of Digo Martin and environs, as the library staff will engage in projects to collect and preserve the oral traditions and customs of this community. It is so important that we understand who we are, but in order to do that, we must include understanding where we came from and the journey we took to arrive where we are. So ladies and gentlemen, the Diego Martin Public Library will be the people's space. I am confident that it will transform and inspire the community. Indeed, its close proximity to the Diego Martin Health Center across the road, the West End Police Station, the Diego Martin Central Secondary School, Diego Martin Central Community Center, and the Diego Martin Central, sorry, the Diego Martin Community Pool, Tennis Courts, and Basketball Court now increases the pool of government resources invested in and available to the burgesses of Diego Martin. No longer jostling as it was for space with other entities. The library, with all its ancillary amenities, is destined to become the intellectual and social hub of this region. Already, we have seen in surveys that were done during our sensitization sessions, and in the feedback that we got uh, online as we prepared for today's opening ceremony, that there is a level of excitement and, and anticipation, for the most part, and I think the chairman dealt with it, but I will have a few things to say about that as well. But for the most part, about the prospects offered by this library. And today I want to give the assurance to the community that everything will be done to ensure that the confidence that you have reposed in us, the anticipation that you have for this library will be repaid handsomely. Like the rest of the world, the library family has embraced technology. They had to, just as we all did. And this Diego Martin Public Library, like all other libraries within the Nalis Network, will serve as a technology hub, offering a wide range of public access capabilities and, of, and internet access services at no charge to the users. Now, that is not to say that it is free, because it isn't. It's just free to you, the user because this government sees it as an investment in you as we do everything we can do across all arms of the state to close that digital divide. We only ask that you repay 
that investment by taking advantage of it respectfully and to take advantage of it with care for the tools we have put at your disposal and for those who will use it after you. All visitors to this public library will have access to the public computers, free Wi-Fi and digital materials such as research resources via the library's website, online databases and e-books. And let me just take a moment to thank the director of the Heritage Library for the assistance she has given to me as a parent of a daughter in O-Levels at 17, very much like Dr. Frederick, who is also doing her history SBA. The library was a real resource to her and her friends as they, as they researched for their own SBA. This library, like all libraries, properly utilized, can level the playing field and help close the gap between those with more access to resources and those with less by providing equal opportunities for persons at all levels. Similarly to what is being done throughout the public library network and in conjunction with the Minister and Ministry of Digital Transformation, this library will continue to offer not only access but digital skills training to senior citizens. Analysis DigiLit program, the digital literacy program, will continue to include our senior citizens, providing pathways to the proper use of WhatsApp and Zoom, things that many of us take for granted because they have become so commonplace for us, but still remain outside of the realm for some. And Wendy, I suspect, well, we will decide whether it is you or me who will contact your mother to let her know that those classes are here. This library will significantly improve the access and use of the internet and digital platforms for all patrons, teaching them a wide ranging variety of literacy skills, starting with reading fundamentals, but also including ICT and digital literacy, media creation skills, civic participation, health literacy, entrepreneurship and, in, and employment skills, as well as the navigation of public services for all patrons who are here seeking the assistance of the library staff. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, this library is an investment in the people of Diego Martin. It is closely aligned to that very first pillar of our national strategic plan, putting people first. But it is an investment that unfortunately seems to be misunderstood or underappreciated by a loud few who would have you believe that in this inexorable march of modernity, brick and mortar libraries are somehow relics of an ancient time. Like Dr. Frederick, I disagree. And it is interesting because they proudly posting their criticisms on social media, utilizing the data packages that they have on their handheld and internet connected devices decry public libraries as somehow the antithesis of progress because according to them, and I think I am being polite in my quotes, they can hold a thousand libraries in the palms of their hands. Unfortunately, sadly, they who seemingly have already crossed that bridge that divides us digitally have only done so in body alone because they are clearly blissfully ignorant of those still standing on the other side. Because firstly, though in possession of their devices, the only data that is available to them comes from either being inside or in close proximity to a public library. And secondly, while there are so many sources of answers to any number of questions that you can search on the internet and social media platforms, there still remains too few places where facts can be easily accessible for us. You know, a movie came out last month, One Love. And for those of you who have not seen it, for those of you who don't know about it, it is the story of a, of a significant period of time in the life and the music career of Bob Marley. And it really looks at the global appeal of his music and his message. Since then, I have seen some persons rushing to associate themselves with his memory. And I accept that that is part, part of it. It is, a, it is 
relevant in the, in the public conversation. But we need to understand it for what it is, and we have to accept it for what it is. But with those games and with the reality that we know exists in the digital space for us and for our children, and because of the targeted opposition to libraries like this one, and the soon to be opened one in the Hawketer in particular, I couldn't help remember some lyrics of Bob Marley's song myself. And that song is Rat Race, and that is particularly appropriate. And the lyric is, in the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. That is profound, nearly 50 years ago. In the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. And Bob had no idea about the future that his children and his grandchildren were going to see. Who of us could have ever thought that we would be living in this space now? And with so many opportunities for information, there is so little space for fact. But we have here librarians who are trained to help with that discernment, to make sense out of the megabytes of information, disinformation, and misinformation for those who would otherwise take that informed or deliberately untruthful position as truth and be led down a path by some of the minuscule minds amongst us. So today I want to thank again the executive, the management, and the staff of Nalis, and particularly the librarians of Nalis, who have dedicated their lives to this vocation, to curbing the enthusiasm of the ignorant and nurturing instead the minds of the curious. This Dago Martin Public Library is as much yours as it belongs to the people of Dago Martin. This library is located at the junction of the more recent Wendy Fitzwilliam Boulevard and the long existing Diego Martin Main Road. And I suppose that is emblematic of the space itself. To be a place where old meets new and vice versa, where different groups can come and meet and collaborate and share and learn from each other across generations and community divisions in this neutral space. This is the space where the police youth clubs, the secondary schools, the primary schools, the youth and the community groups and NGOs in this region can now partner with NALIS to offer expanded services to their membership and provide them with a new level of engagement, opening their eyes to even more possibilities. You see, the truth is this, that we we know that Diego Martin is not immune from the crime and criminality and the violence that comes from that life and culture. But as a government, we are as equally focused on finding and providing solutions to the root causes at the start of that journey as we are to addressing the outcomes at the end of it. And so I want to offer today this public library as an oasis of peace and transformation for those who no longer desire war. Because within these walls lies the keys to your freedom. Keys which you can turn for yourself to open doors ahead of you instead of being in a place where keys are turned by others for you to close doors behind you. In this space, we have this auditorium. And just ahead of it, we have the amphitheater where performances can be managed and where community creatives can find outlets for their creative skills seven days a week, seven days a week, Sundays and public holidays when the library would be traditionally be closed. And so apart from my joy at being in the presence of storyteller and folklorist Paul Keynes Douglas, I'm equally grateful for the presence today of the indomitable Dr. Hollis Chalk, Dr. Liverpool, ORTT who can be ascribed many titles, author, educator, historian, Calypsonian extraordinaire. But today I wish to acknowledge him for all those and one more as a long-standing and valued resident of this region. Dr. Liverpool, thank you for being here with us. And while both these goodly gentlemen have performed regionally and internationally. 
this space gives them a new place to call home. And it's my expectation that Nalis actively engages them, along with our other Diamond Vale gems in Wendy Fitzwilliam and Dr. Frederick, to share their experience and wisdom with their home community in general, but in particular with the young, bright minds of this, this region. Ladies and gentlemen, as you have undoubtedly gleaned, I am a happy man today that we have brought this particular project to this stage. Waiting in the wings are the Miaro and La Hocta Public Libraries, both of which we expect to bring to completion as well within this year. And additionally, in areas that are not currently served or underserved by a dedicated library service, NALIS is aiming to expand its delivery of library and information services through the co-location of libraries in new community centers, those who are, that are either currently under construction or have been recently opened. But in addition to those, there will be the community of Kokorit, where the refurbishments works of the Kokorit Community Center are expected to be completed this year. So as I close, I want to offer again my sincere congratulations to the board, executive, management, staff, and in particular, the librarians of Nalis for their dedication and commitment. I offer my immense thanks to the board and management, the staff and the entire team at UDICOT for the delivery of yet another major project, and of course, to the contracting firm of China Railway for the most important part in bringing us to today. I thank you all for joining us here this morning and for the courtesy of your attention. And for those of you who are not yet in possession of one, Please register to get your library cards prepared for you, your families, your children, and your loved ones. It is your gateway and their gateway to a whole new world. Thank you. Thank you, Minister De Nobrega. At this point in our program, let's welcome Tazea O'Connor, former Junior Calypso Monarch, with his rendition of Sparrow's Education. This occasion, but I know we are Trinidadians and we can sing, and we know this song, so you all can sing with me, okay? Children go to school and learn well, otherwise, later on in life, you go catch real hell without an education in your head. Your whole life will be pure misery. You're better off dead. For there is simply no room in this whole wide world for an uneducated little boy or girl. Don't allow idle companion to lead you astray. To earn tomorrow, you got to learn today. Education, education, this is the foundation. Our rising population needs some education to be recognized anywhere you go. You got to have your certificate to show to enjoy any kind of happiness. Knowledge is the key to success. Sing it with me. Children go to school and learn. Nice. Otherwise, later on in life, they go catch real hell. Without an education in your... Your whole life will be pure misery. You're better off dead. For there is simply no room in this whole wide world For an uneducated little boy or girl 
So don't tell our idle companion to lead you astray. To earn tomorrow, you got to learn today. Employment, yes, employment, good for enjoyment. And it's essential, very essential, to have your credentials. But if you're block-headed like a mule, you see, no one will employ a fool. You will be the last one to be hired and the very first one to be fired. So children go to school and learn well, well, well. Otherwise, later on in life, you go catch real hell. Without an education in your, your whole life will be pure misery, you're better off dead. For there is simply no room in this whole wide world for an uneducated little boy. Don't allow idle companion to lead you astray. To earn, you got to learn. Sing it one more time. Children go to school and learn. Otherwise, later on in life, you go catch real hell without an education in your. Your whole life will be pure misery. Look, you're better off dead. For there is simply no room in this for an uneducated little boy or girl. So don't allow idle companion to lead you astray. To earn tomorrow, you got to learn today. Thank you very much. Thank you to Zia O'Connor, accompanied by Shamari. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so honored, pleased, and privileged to welcome to the lectern Dr. the Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley, Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, to bring us today's feature address. Thank you very much, Nigel, our Master of Ceremonies. Let me start by saying good morning to Diego Martin and the Byrons. Particularly good morning to Diego Martin West. All the good people have left the East and they want to move and they ended up in the West. Permit me to acknowledge the presence of my cabinet colleagues of the Government of Trinidad and Tobago Member of Parliament for Diego Martin Northeast, Minister of Finance, Colin Imbert. Also, I have with me the last speaker, the last feature speaker, the Minister, Minister of Communications, Member of Parliament, Diego Martin Central, who assumed the responsibility because we are actually located in Diego Martin Central, but we really here belong to Diego Martin West. <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge our, uh, the mayor of the new borough of Diego Martin, the alderman Akila Glasgow Warner, who was a former councillor in the Diego Martin Corporation, but now holding the mantle for the newest borough. And I also would like to acknowledge my former cabinet colleague, now chairman of NALIS, Mr. Deal Pasadlal and members of the Board of Malice and Malice of Management. And most importantly this morning, welcoming home to the Diamond Vale community, I must acknowledge the educator, medical doctor, former president of Howard University, philanthropist, 
Dr. Wayne Frederick of Diamondville Lady Martin. And also, I must acknowledge and apologize for my friend Wendy Fitzwilliam, who, with no prompting, no practice, read what was for me my morning vocation, those passages from Judy Raymond's book and the biography of Beryl McBurney. I, I pushed Wendy into that this morning straight from Tobago to do that because sometime this week, I think it's tomorrow, is it's Friday, um, International Women's Day. And I thought that Wendy reading something about Beryl McBurney is as good as we could have gotten Trinidad and Tobago to acknowledge International Women's Day. So let's thank Wendy for that. <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge two other icons of our nation, Dr. Hollis Liverpool, who holds the order of Trinidad and Tobago, OITT. Thank you very much for coming. I was hoping, I was hoping that he could have tagged a few bars for us this morning, but the young man did us proud, so I'm sure he too is proud of that. And of course, my former hall mate from Mona, Jamaica, Paul Kings Douglas of Tantum World fame. Welcome to the community here this morning. And our parish priests and members of the clergy, thank you for participating in this exercise. And once again, I have to acknowledge and thank Mr. Noel Garcia, Chairman of UDICOT, and the UDICOT team of architects and project managers who time after time deliver these infrastructural projects as we try to build the Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. And we have with us this morning the people for whom we work and even for whom we live, our students, our future, our young people from the various schools in our community, <laughs> and the uh, teachers, residents, stalwarts, stakeholders all, members of the media, and of course, all ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Diego Martin Valley. I trust that you would have gathered the intention of reading that particular passage that when we read from Judy Raymond's book, taking us back over 500 years to a life starting in the 15th century in a place called Trinidad, 3,000 people, and the little city of Port of Spain, notorious for its bad behavior. I, I, I can't help but tell this story over and over. You read Douglas Etwell's book, and you'd see there where somewhere in the laws of Grenada at some time, having come from Trinidad, because of the bad behavior that was well known about this Trinidad, having come from that place was sufficient and no more was required to have you jailed in Grenada. But I say that in this community, which has quite a number of Grenadian households who I represent, that we have come a long, long way. And coming here this morning to open this state-of-the-art facility for a community which I would say is the most desirable in the nation is a long, long way from that city of Port of Spain, that grew past Belmont of the Free Slave communities, a past Woodbrook, past St. James, and you end up in Diego Martin. And today, Diego Martin is home to all of us, and the whole nation is proud of Diego Martin as we are proud of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, I've heard it said by some people, fortunately a few, that this kind of infrastructural investment is outdated. Ladies and gentlemen, as Prime Minister of this country for my ninth year, I could tell you, I cannot point to a single thing that the government has set about to do in this country where it didn't have somebody or a small group of people, even a large group of people, who would just for the sake of objection object to it. Even when the objection is more a reflection of their own shortcomings than that of the government. You know, very frequently we hear in our community about violence, crime, and killings. And invariably, the people involved, especially the victims, 
are people or some person who was lying in. And if you come from Mars and you land in Trinidad, with that information, you would come to the reasonable conclusion that this lining is a major pastime and is also very dangerous because it could get you killed. What this facility represents as an investment for the people of the entire valley and surroundings of Diego Martin is an opportunity to spend time doing something else, something different something positive, something uplifting, something valuable. Of course, you need a place to do that. Sleeping is something good, but you can't do it all the time, but you need a good place to sleep, so you build a house, and when you go in there, you sleep, and you wake up, and you feel refreshed. That's what this library will do. But I'll tell you something else, too. Those same critics, if we had not built this, and what MP Demobiga told you about the closing down of the library that operated out of Ken Valley's office and by the, uh, the, 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 the cooperative and eventually died for lack of goodness. That person would have said, you know, all them years Rowdy was there and he was prime minister of the country and look, Digger Martin didn't have a library. The same, same, same person. So you know what that tells me? On this and similar decisions, take the Nike slogan and just do it. We've done it. Thank you very much, Mindika. We've done it. We have a number of schools in this valley with a number of teachers. I see one of our principals, the principal of Digger Martin, boys, I, see, I saw him here this morning somewhere, and there are others here with him. Every single one of those educators will know the value of this facility in this valley. Just directing our young and our not so young people, including adult courses, come to this place. Just be here. And you will find something interesting to attract you for the good. If I do find myself saying a lot about libraries, and as an administrator, and decision maker in the country would have driven a lot of it. It is because of how it affected me personally, and I know from personal knowledge how library changed my life. Because I was going to high school, the best high school in Tobago. And even though I had a curriculum to follow, and I followed it because not because I loved the curriculum, but because there were consequences if you didn't. And I also had a lot of chores to do, including feeding animals, cutting grass, looking for wood, and that sort of thing. But I always found myself attracted to the library in the end as a place quiet, peaceful, and overflowing with information. As a young person, I was drawn to the library, which, which existed in what is now the Tobago House of Assembly Chamber. There was a library there. And some person gave the library a whole stack of books. And that, those books were put in a corner. They were not part of my curriculum in school. None of it was my curriculum. But I was just attracted to the availability of those books. And in those days, you got a library card and you could borrow two books and keep them for two weeks and you got to bring them back, otherwise you had the penalty to pay for I kept one for, I kept one for 34 years. <laughs> but as a, as a student in Bishop's High School, when I was in third form, I discovered that corner and I gave myself the added assignment of reading out those books, reading out that corner. Can't tell you how many books I read there, but it was a lot. And it was there that I discovered, I just put, take the book out, read, get it back. It was there I discovered Nabokov, James Joyce, Edgar Mittelholzer, Selvon. You know, a lot of people whose works were not part of my curriculum in school. So I was being educated in school. I probably get good grades, come out with a good certificate. 
But I can tell you, I would have been partially educated. I would say to you that a significant part of my education was voluntarily applied to me from the library in Scarborough. It was only later in life, as I developed further, I discovered and could discourse against the background of those voluntary readings. It was the same thing in science. It was there I discovered relativity and Einstein's work. And who was Einstein? They didn't teach me that in, in, a, in the curriculum in the school. I, got, I, I, I loved history, I loved geography, I loved science. But the school's curriculum is only a fraction of what is learnable and a tiny fraction of what is available. And it's only the library that is the repository of all of that. And those who tell you that, oh, we are in the digital age, so a library is an accuracy. In this library is where Diego Martin will meet the digital age, where the digital age would be accept acceptable and accessible to every citizen, young boy or girl. These youngsters who are here today, I saw them smiling at the Calypso being rendered, and some even were following the words. They might have heard it before. But today is that day when they would have been told, you got to learn well, otherwise your life could be real hell. That is not the word of God, it's the word of Sparrow. And it's true. It's true. So we have given them the opportunity, and all I ask my constituents of Diego Martin, all of Diego Martin, just come here. You will meet people here who will show you what you can learn, what you can do here. And I trust it wouldn't just be learning for exams, it would be learning for life. I look forward to Paul being on this stage and taking us through some of his presentations. I trust that we can have opportunities to be invited here, where Dr. Hollis Liverpool or others in his line of learning would sit here and just talk to people. Those conversations are missing from our community. A huge, dose, a huge dose of ignorance and dotishness takes over Trinidad and Tobago national conversation. When in fact, we have so much good that could be spoken to us. And there are so many people who are willing to talk to us about the things that we should learn. The quality of our citizenry would be improved if we only come. I don't want to sound like a preacher in the church because it's the same conversation. It's the same conversation as he invites you to heaven. He says, only believe. Only believe. That's all you have to do. And then, of course, just come to the church. Once you come through the door, he's guaranteed that you come through the door, I will help you with life. This library is saying the same thing to you, Diego Martin. Just come here. Bring your children here. Send your children here. Practice here. Learn here. And of course, Dr. Wayne Frederick is not the only possibility for Diego Martin to have produced a world-class citizen right here from this community in Diego Martin, whether it's from the hills or the lowlands. Because we in Trinidad and Tobago, we are a land full of opportunities. Of course, if you listen, to some people, the bad behavior of a few that is, is continuously in front of our face, some people will have you believe that that is the sum total of the country. Dangerous and damaging as that is, unproductive and obstructive as that is, it is not our country. We are fighting that. We are fighting to stop it to remove it so that we can develop faster and further. But that is not Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago is the Beryl McBurney that you heard about this morning. Trinidad and Tobago lies in the text and the melodies of Hollis Liverpool that covered a wide range of our living. From the first Calypso tent he ever sang him to the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, not all of us 
are doctors of philosophy. But we are all important in the making of this nation. So when Paul King Douglas writes and talks and humors us with Aunt Tanti Mull, there are great stories in there of our own lives. And some people overcome huge challenges to success. Today, Dr. Frederick is here. This program should have been this afternoon. But he isn't available this afternoon, he's really this morning. So I changed the time from this afternoon to this morning because I wanted him to tell you, as he always does, of the challenges that he faced towards the success that he had become. I know his grandmother. I know his mother. His mother nursed him as a sick child with a chronic ailment that many people would never have overcome. And of course, he didn't tell you stories about arriving in Howard, weighing 95 pounds, and being described <laughs> in a number of ways. But none of that, none of that kept him back from becoming the most successful Diego Martin man outside of Diego Martin on the world stage today. Most of us in our households have difficulties and challenges, but we have stories of success that could be told to inspire, and I trust that even as we are speaking here this morning, we are inspiring somebody in that crowd of two dozen students there, because we have to always inspire them. But we have to inspire them with possibilities of success, not with hopelessness and failure. Failure sometimes attends us, but it must only be temporary, because it is said, it is not that you fall, that is the shame, it is your inability to lift yourself up to get up and try again. That is the shame. But once you are prepared, once you are prepared to work towards success, to believe in success, these infrastructural offerings will assist you along the way. I would like to know that all of the schools in this community would acknowledge the existence of this investment of the nation in our community, and that the teachers and educators all would see what they can do here to contribute, if not to every child, to one child, to some children. And also there are a number of adult usages that can come in this library that would make the whole of the community a better place. Much of what is available in here, in keeping with the current technological aspects of life, were not available to those of us who, for whom a library long ago was only a storage of books, an old table and a chair, and the requirement for silence in the building. That was a library. A library today is far more than that. The ease with which one can access information is good, but it is also dangerous to development hitting a key or two and getting information from Wikipedia or Google is one thing. But one has to understand that there are limitations in that too. Limitations in your own development. If you don't think and just rely on the keys, if you are not able to compare and do, have comparators in your own thoughts, you will soon atrophy because you become too reliant and too dependent on that. I could tell you that because those of us who pass through the age of multiplying on paper to show your workings and then having to understand the slide rule and how it, how it was, how it worked, and having to understand the calculus tables, the sine and cosine, the huge numbers, we had to do that. But we had to understand it. And then when calculators became available, HP calculators, one just punch something and the answer come out. But okay, foolishness goes in, foolishness comes out. Now we are a million times more reliant on that. You know, I can't even remember my own phone number now. Because if somebody asks me, what is so-and-so num numbers are now stored by name. Long time you knew the number of a hundred people. Mem memorize it because that's how it was. But if you don't understand why how the equation works, and you're only relying on punching in a key to get out a number, 
then if a wrong number comes out for any reason, you are dangerous. Understand? So, ladies and gentlemen, even as the digital age is upon us, there is a requirement to be anchored in the basics. And the first basic has to be a desire to learn, that eagerness to absorb. And that's what we want to offer to our children. And for those who have gone past children's stage, or even have work to do, personal development is permanent education on the move. After you get your certification, you've only been given an opportunity to continue to learn. And this library is available for that continuation. For those who miss opportunities, new opportunities are available. And you know what, in Trinidad and Tobago, after the national anthem, the next word, free. It's all free. It's all free to you but at a cost to the rest of the taxpayers because somebody has to pay for it. Whatever you get here for free is being paid for by other taxpayers, including you if you have to if you make a contribution. We all, we all contribute. So let us value it. Let us make sure it works for us. Let us not listen to the overflowing negatives. We have no shortage of negative conversation in our country down to the point of stupidity. I mean, this morning I'm hearing a member of parliament with a theory, long conspiracy theory, that the only reason why that boat could have struck Tobago and leaked oil on our beaches is because it was sneaking through Trinidad and Tobago to... Ladies and gentlemen, if you know anything about the geography of our country, you know on one side you have the Atlantic Ocean, on the other side, the Caribbean Sea, and anybody going from one to the other must pass through between Trinidad and Tobago or between Tobago and Grenada, going on wherever you're going, whether it's legal or illegal, that's where you have to pass to go. Something happened, and all of a sudden the geography changed. The only reason why that vessel could have been going there is because it was smuggling got oil from so and so and so and so, and the government was involved, and Rowley was involved, and Young was involved. How much dotishness they will talk in Trinidad and Tobago? This library is meant to change the perspective of the people of Diego Martin and by extension, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, so that we can get involved in serious conversations that are beneficial to our well being. There's too much dotishness in the public domain in Trinidad and Tobago. Too many schools in Trinidad and Tobago. And that is why I asked Wendy this morning to read that passage dating back to the occupation of this island because I'll tell you something. Much of what she read there this morning, if you stop anybody on the street in Trinidad and Tobago and ask them a question about any of that, you're guaranteed to get a wrong answer because we are not paying attention to those basics because some people believe they have no value. But we need to understand our past to be able to appreciate our future. In fact, the more we understand of our past, the stronger we are and the better positioned we are to appreciate our present and to work for a better future. Ignorance is never a good perspective and is never a good foundation on which to launch an attack on your own circumstance. So ladies and gentlemen, let us hold up education as Dr. Williams did. Let us hold up opportunity as our country provides all of us. And let us take responsibility for the outcome. Because the teachers have some responsibility for that period when you're under their care. Even your parents have some responsibility. But at the end of the day, as you develop, as you grow young people, more and more of that responsibility is yours. You have to develop and determine what you would want to be. And you may very well find the answer to that through your visits to the library. I want to end on that note today. Visit the library. Visit the libraries. Talk to those who work here. Talk to those who've been here. 
Read as much as you can. And there's no better reading, as far as I am concerned, than when you read from books. I'll tell you something that you may not know. I read a lot of books, and I discovered that I have a photographic memory. I can read a book and keep in front of me a particular page in that book and a paragraph in that book and literally read it as I'm talking to you. I did that for years, that's me, until Kindle came out. <laughs> and I got a Kindle very quickly because a Kindle could store hundreds of books or thousands of books. And then I discovered that I could not memorize a page in a Kindle. Somehow, once I, once I change the page, I can't memorize it. I can't, it. It doesn't stay as if I've read it from a book. And eventually, I put the Kindle in a drawer on my bed. And I still have my 20 books at my bedside. And I still read and I still buy books. Maybe that's me, that might not be you, but we all have to know what works for us. What works for us. And I'm sure what's gonna work for these young people is the opportunity to come to a place like this, to meet what we have here for them, for the entire community, and we hope they use it to make Trinidad and Tobago, especially Diego Martin, a better place, a place in which we can all be proud. Thank all of you who have worked to create this structure, to create this facility, and thanks in advance to all of you who will work here to make our next generation more accomplished than ours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. At this point in our program, we will now have presentation by Mr. Neil Parson Lal, Chairman of the Board of NALIS, of NALIS Library Registration Cards to Dr. Rowley, to the Honorable Coleman, but and to Dr. Wayne Frederick. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the library cards that I will present to the three honorable persons amongst us. Actually, what we call pathways to, to, an entire, to a whole new world. Analysis Library Card allows you not just to borrow books when you physically come into the library, but Analysis Library Card allows you to stay from the privacy of your own homes and actually borrow books online. We've gone that far. So on behalf of the board, the executive of Analysis Management and all the librarians, we want to present these library cards. Firstly, to Dr. Keith Rowley, to the Honorable Colm Imbert, and then to Dr. William Frederick. These library cards will provide access to analysis resources online and at libraries across analysis network. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite Doctor of Letters, Paul Keynes Douglas, to present the Honorable Prime Minister with his autobiographed children's book titled String Bank. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister Rowley, for your feature address, bringing us wisdom, insight, and knowledge. And special thanks to all distinguished speakers who delivered remarks and readings today. Members of Parliament, the Cabinet, various ministry officials, specially invited guests, residents, students, stakeholders, members of the media, 
and members of the listening and viewing public, thank you all for your very kind participation at today's opening ceremony. Thank you, Father Gomez, for the opening prayer. We thank those who worked so hard to prepare this site for today's ceremony. And thank you all, entertainers. We will now have the cutting of the ribbon and the unveiling of the commemorative stone by the Prime Minister and his entourage, consisting of honorable ministers, the mayor, Dr. Frederick, UDICOT chairman and CEO rep and representatives of NALIS, as well as our cultural icons, Dr. Hollis Liverpool, Wendy Fitzwilliam, and uh, Paul Keenstam. Yes, we may proceed now.
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, so the core of the public life is...